Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the county board April and that group the order. Seen. Would you all rise and but <clears throat> I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. <clears throat> Are you ready? Roll call. Oh, oh, where's my thing? Oh, here it is. Mr. Green, if you're here, if you're not here. I'm trying, I'm trying. All present, 21. Uh, right now, we'll have a moment of silence for the victims and the people involved in um, Boston and throughout the world. I think everybody in the world was touched by this. So we'll have a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Poet Month. And uh, we're going to have a poem, much like last time, recited to us from uh, Ms. Bar Bernard. So you can go right. Yeah. I don't think I'll show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Grant. I'm Francia Barnard from Bailey's Harbor. And I am honored to be presenting a local poem to you to help celebrate Poetry Month. I apologize ahead of time to those of you who would prefer rhyming poetry. Weavers, for the Hickey Brothers fishermen. They stand side by side in the low ceiling shack, two strong young men practicing an old man's art. Neck pulled to line, hold tight, over, around, and through. Gossamer nets hang low between them. Two taut nylon lines stretch waist high through the room, attached to opposite walls. Ten phrases of six, then three on the float, over, around, and through. Bobbins in hand, they snail pace backwards, catch line to net, and tie it tight. Eyes never lifting, rhythm unbroken, hours a day, days for weeks. Ten phrases of six, then three on the lead, over, around, and through. Summertime catchers of fish, wintertime menders of nets. From their deft hands grow new webs, Arachne's opus before Athena's ire. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> We're going to deviate from the agenda a little bit. We're going to uh, skip right down to... Um, um, 2013 23 support installation of J turn at the intersection of Highway 57 and C. Uh, John, if you'd like to make a motion and we'll second it and then. I'll make a motion in support of 2013 23. Okay. I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, we're going to call the DOT up here and uh, he's going to give us a presentation on, on the J turn. Scott Nelson, right? Yep. This is Scott Nelson from the DOT. Grant, you want to grab the lights, sir? I think he's going to show something on. Thanks, Dan. Uh, once again, my name is Scott Nelson, and I'm the region safety engineer for the Wisconsin DOT out of the Green Bay office. Um, I was actually a member of the Door County Safety Meeting for about 12 years as well. So um, today I'm here to talk about Highway 57 and C, uh, which, as many of you know, we've had. Um, <clears throat> um, quite a few crashes at this intersection and we've got a treatment today that I'd like to present that I think has some merit moving forward. Um, the diagram you see up there on, on the screen right now is the intersection of 57 and C. Uh, you can see the, the locations in the middle of a horizontal curve. Uh, you can also notice the median widens a bit as you get to the intersection itself. Um, and then if you can go to the next slide please. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the crash types that we've been seeing at this intersection. And you may have to just uh, downsize it a little bit. 
All right, this is the intersection of 57 and C, and what you're seeing here, this is what we call a collision diagram, and it's where we try to look at the type of crashes that are occurring and look for patterns and such like that to try to figure out what we can do for countermeasures to address <laughs> those type of crashes that are occurring. Um, if you note, um, there's different shapes there. The circles are property da damage crashes, the triangles are injury crashes, and um, there's also some letters next to them which um, indicate the severity of the crash. Um, so a type A is an incapacitating injury, a type B is non-incapacitating, and a C is a possible injury. So our type A are most severe, uh, type C are our least severe injuries. Um, when you look at the arrows, um, we'll show the nature of the crash. So for example, if you're headed northbound on C, if you look toward the top of the screen, you can see how a southbound 57 motorist is, is been hitting the vehicles there. There's a pretty good grouping of them there. At the same way, if you're going south on Highway C, you can see how a northbound uh, vehicle on 57 has been striking that vehicle. So the type of intersection crashes that we've been seeing are on the far side of the intersection. Um, the motorist is stopping. They get across to the median. When they get from the median to go to the far side is where that, where that crash has been occurring. So both northbound and southbound from C. Um, we did have one on the near side <coughs> where it was a, where they're hit on the near side, but the majority of the crashes are on the far side. So the question is, what do we do to address the type of crashes that are occurring? And really, we've got some options on the table. Um, certainly, um, eliminating the intersection, obviously, if C no longer intersect at 57 would be the safest intersection, but obviously, that's not a good solution given the importance of Highway C running north-south. Um, the next safest intersection that we would have, and costs kind of increase as we move up the scale, of course, is if we would just physically close off that median in the middle, no longer allow people to cross whatsoever. So basically, if they came from Highway C, they could only, or if they're on 57, they could turn right onto C, or if they're on C, they could turn right off of C, okay? So once again, that's a very safe maneuver because they're making right turns, which is a very safe maneuver, and that would work very well from a safety perspective. However, from a circulation perspective, that doesn't work very well with motors trying to get north-south. <clears throat> the next step we could take, and it increases in cost a bit again, is we'd allow the same thing, is there's a right in, right out, just like we talked about, but we could also allow left turns to occur from Highway 57 onto C, okay? But we would not allow people to cross Highway C or turn left from Highway C. Those movements would not be allowed. And that would be very similar to what we've done at the intersection of 42, 57 in um, Utah Street. Um, which when we had a safety issue there, it's kind of addressed that issue. So that would be a solution. And then the last, and then the next step would be is actually what we call a J-turn, which I'm going to show you a short video on of what that's about. And of course, the thing we could go beyond that is we could go to a physical interchange. Um, but the interchange, obviously, there's a lot of competition statewide for that, and the costs get extremely uh, much, much higher. We're talking probably maybe $500,000, I would say, tops to build this J-turn type intersection. If we went to an interchange, it could be up to 10, 12, 15 million dollars, depending on what we get into it. So it's, it's a huge jump in costs, um, but certainly from a mobility standpoint, that's the nicest thing. And obviously as a safety engineer, I love interchanges. Um, they work very well. We still have crashes at the ramp terminals, but we generally don't have the real high speed type crashes we've been seeing. So I'd like to play the video here, and then after that, I'd like to uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask me some questions. One of the Wisconsin Department of Transportation's primary goals is making roads safer. One way to accomplish this is with a new intersection called a J-turn. Department engineers are beginning to build J-turns at various locations on divided highways. A J-turn allows drivers to cross traffic on busy roads more safely. The Wisconsin DOT plans to install this new type of intersection at several locations across the state. So what exactly is a J-turn? While drivers will still be able to make all the same movements they make at traditional intersections, you can proceed straight through the intersection, turn right or turn left from the main highway. However, accomplishing a straight through or left turn movement from a side road will be a little different from how it was done in the past. Now it will involve a J-turn. Rather than turning left, drivers will initially turn right in the same direction as traffic. Then they will safely merge into a left turn lane. Finally, they will make a U-turn when an acceptable gap exists in oncoming traffic and head in the opposite direction. From there, they can keep going straight or turn right and continue on the original road. For me, the, the old traditional crossing, uh, you're dealing with, if you're going to make a left turn, you're dealing with a minimum of four lanes of traffic going in two different directions. The J-turn, when I approach the J-turn, if I'm going to make a left turn, I have to look at, to my left, I deal with two lanes of traffic going one direction. 
and they're right outside my driver's door. When I make that turn, when I get down to make my J loop of my J turn, I'm dealing with two lanes of traffic, only two lanes of traffic, and they're going the same direction and they're right out my windshield. And to me, that the conflict of traffic is so much simpler and safer and, and uh, there's no comparison. A four-lane divided highway intersection with cross traffic has dozens of potential vehicle conflict or crash points. The majority of those conflict points could lead to very severe or even fatal crashes. I like the J-turn because it's eliminated that dangerous intersection, that T-bone intersection that we used to have to deal. There wasn't even room for a bus as you cross the, the uh, intersection to actually stay safely in the median. Um, so you really had to consider it a go from the stop sign into that lane almost as a merge. And uh, of course now with the J-turn, we've eliminated that, that possibility of being hit. It was a pretty nervous uh, intersection as a bus driver. When crossing a typical four-lane divided highway, motorists must be aware of traffic approaching from both directions on the divided highway, speed the traffic is traveling, and whether traffic is turning and in what direction. That is a lot of information to process when making a decision to proceed from a side road. Most of the people that were injured or killed at that intersection were our, our neighbors, and uh, one of the boys that was killed actually rode on my bus, and uh, he had missed school and took a car across the intersection and got killed. And I can put up with a lot of um, inconvenience to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I think since the J-turn has been put in, um, I think it's proven that we're, we don't have any accidents. At the intersection of Highway 53 and County Road B south of Superior, there was an average of three to four crashes per year. Most of the crashes that were occurring at the Highway 53 County B intersection were right angle crashes that occurred on the far side of the intersection after the vehicles had crossed the median. Uh, this resulted in some severe crashes, sometimes fatal because of the 65 mile hour speed limit on Highway 53. After a J-turn was constructed in the year 2011, the results are very encouraging. After one full year of operation, there have been no reported crashes at the intersection. At a J-turn intersection, the crossing becomes much simpler because you only need to concern yourself with one direction of travel at a time as you complete your J-turn. Even though motorists moving from a side road might have to drive a little farther, using a J-turn often saves time. Waiting for a gap to cross four lanes of fast-moving traffic can be a time-consuming and stressful experience for drivers. Used in the right locations, J-turns will move Wisconsin drivers more quickly and safely. All right. So that's uh, a little description of what a J-turn is. I just wanted to mention that uh, the intersection mentioned here is at 53 and B. It's in Douglas County. It was built about a year ago. Um, <coughs> if you're familiar with uh, Maplewood Meets, just west of Green Bay on Highway 29, we are starting a J-turn there. Um, actually, next week, construction is going to begin building a J-turn there. And we also have one at Highway 23 and M going in this year in Sheboygan County as well. Um, if you've been to Michigan, some of these same traits, you've kind of seen that these, they call the Michigan Lefts, are very similar to this. Um, again, I guess the big thing I want to stress you with the J-turn is, is we're looking at a, a, a fairly low-cost countermeasure to address the type of crashes that are occurring, okay? Um, and I'm not here to say it's going to be, it is going to be less convenient uh, because you are going to need to go perhaps a quarter of a mile to a half mile down the road to come back, okay? So it will add time to your trip. But again, what we're trying to do is simplify the driving task, okay? You will no longer need to look to your left, look to your right, look across, try to determine who's turning left, who's turning, trying to process all that information when you make your decision to cross or not. The idea is it's trying to simplify the driving task and kind of break it up. So all you really need to do is look to your left, enter the highway, make one lane change, get in your, into the J-turn or the turnaround, the U-turn part. Now you're looking right out your windshield, that one direction of traffic again, and you come right back. Um, so once again, it is less, less convenient. Um, but I'm confident that it could do a lot to improve the safety at that intersection. It's still an intersection and crashes could still occur, um, but I firmly believe that it would be a lot safer intersection um, than what we have today. Um, so with that, I guess I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Go ahead, Hugh. Yes, sir. Uh, so you would have to have two of these J-turns in C, in other words, one for northbound, one for southbound, is that? That's correct, okay. yes. And what we would try to do is, you notice where the intersection's in the middle of the curve, we would take and build those J-turns down far enough so that we're out of the curve. So you're looking at a tangent, a straight section of highway. So these J-turns actually work very well for in the middle of a horizontal curve because you can kind of take that curve out of play uh, when you're making that turn and you're looking straight down the tangent section of the highway. 
But any other questions? I'd just like to make a couple bullet points here that I asked, uh, this is the second or third time I've seen this. So the one question I asked Scott is that this would be at no cost to the county. The DOT would pick the total cost up, correct? That, that's correct. And um, obviously the best place, the best thing would be an overpass. And that, like he just said, just to remind you, that's 10 to 15 years out if in fact you would get the okay, which is very, and that costs like 10 to $15 million. And this could be accomplished the J turn within the next one or two years, correct? Yeah, so we hope it really depends on whether or not we need a little bit of right away for those turnarounds and what kind of that process takes. You know, we got a process to go through that. But if it's not right away, we could probably get it done, yeah, pretty quickly like that. That would be our goal. We're going to put a lot of effort on it to get it done as quickly as we can. And what they're looking from us is a support of it. So, has anybody got any questions? Biz? <clears throat> Does DOT own enough property to, to do this? Well, everything done would be done in the median at the intersection would be fine. It's only at that J turn where we have that ball boat for the trucks that make that. That would be the only two points that we'd possibly need right away. So we don't have the survey data and exact locations where those will be at. So as part of our design, we'll look at that. And if that would be the only place we would need it. Certainly nothing in the median, nothing on the turn lanes on the approach or nothing like that. It would be a very small amount that we would need, if any. Go ahead, Chuck. I, I guess... What, what did you find was the uh, major cause of accidents down there? Yeah, you know, I've worked pretty closely with the Sheriff's Department, State Patrol, we've all kind of looked at it, and, and it just appears motors are doing a very good job judging gaps to get across the first set of lanes. And, it, and there have been a few where they've not stopped to get across the second lane, they just continued. But the majority of the motorists are actually, <laughs> according to the crash reports in the Sheriff's Department, they are actually stopping and yielding, and they're just picking a poor gap. They're not picking an adequate gap. You know, and I don't know if it's because they're looking through that doorpost on the passenger side um, with that curvature there. That could be playing into it a little bit. Um, but from a sight distance standpoint and a time standpoint from the standards, you know, I think we're looking at like 13 seconds of sight distance, and so we look for about eight and a half. Um, so there's enough time there. It's just a poor judgment on the gaps is what it really appears. So. Any age to it that affects it? There's some. I mean, it's kind of scattered about. There was a, there's a fair amount of the elderly, um, you know, I would say, you know, probably like 65 and higher, but there's a scattering, you know, below that level too that's pretty evenly distributed, so. Go ahead, John. Well, if nobody else got any questions, I just wanted to say this comes down to the, the old adage that the squeaky wheel gets to grease. We've passed it at the Highway Safety Committee. We've passed it at the uh, uh, Highway Committee itself. We have a meeting in Brussels tonight, and the more support we can get to this, the better chance we've got it getting it sooner and faster. And that, that, that's why it's here today to add to support to our, our effort to f forward this as fast as possible. Okay, are there any other questions? Richard. Um, <clears throat> are most of the, the accidents, I think, like Chuck asked, are they elderly people? Are they, they are? There, there are, I would say, I don't have an order in front of me, but I'd say a, a quarter to a third of them probably are in that 65 or higher, the at-fault driver. But there's still that other two-thirds to three-quarter that are, you know, so scattering you, throughout. So, so do you think some of the accidents were caused from incompetent drivers? Do you think? or I don't know. I, it's, it's hard from an engineering you know, standpoint me, to say for it's... For me, it's hard to realize how you have an accident there. But I guess the figures don't lie, you know, but... Right, and we've tried some other countermeasures. We've done a bunch of adjusting signs, and we've got rid of some of the wood posts. We went to Telspar to make it narrower so you can see better. We've adjusted heights of signs. We've done about what we can. And, and from, like I said, from an engineering standpoint, we've got enough median width. We've got enough sight distance. All those things add up to say they should be able to safely make it. Uh, but the bottom line is they're not. And um, so that's why I'm trying to come up with something here that I think can address that and just simplify it. I, I guess what I'm kind of getting at is I think because it was a new intersection for a lot of the people, that probably the cause, that's probably what caused the accidents. And, and my thinking that with this new J-turn thing, now you're going to have a new thing again, which is going to confuse people more um, as far as local people. Uh, I just, I, you know, and to spend whatever, $23 million or something like that, even though the county's not. No, that's not correct. Uh, or $15 million or. No, 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 no. Well, 15 to 20 million. 500000 To do an overpass, to do yeah, the J-turn. Right, the J-turn is like $500,000. Yeah. 
which again, I'm, I'm using round numbers. You know, we don't have the engineering done to know. A lot of the turn lanes in the middle, we can salvage some of that, and it's just kind of closing up that median in the middle, and it's really building those two left turn lanes, one on each side, like the gentleman here talked about for the J turn. To me, I think the people aren't going to know where the heck to go. Well, we signed up pretty well, and like I said, it's it's pretty simplified. We'll do some outreach, obviously. We'll uh, try to do what we can from an outreach standpoint. Um, I was was on WDOR earlier this week, kind of talking about them a little bit there, asking questions. So we'll be committed to doing some outreach to try to educate people. They're very, very well signed. Um, when you come up, your vehicle's pointed where you really can only turn right, and, and they're signed very well. Um, but certainly there'll be a learning curve. There's no question about it. There will be a learning curve. But um, So if you're going south on C... Yes. You want to go north on the highway. Yep. You're going to have to go to the right. That's correct. For a half mile or something like that. A quarter, then, yeah, about a quarter mile to a half you, mile. Yep. Then you got to get over in the left lane, right? Yep. In order to turn there. Yep. And then you're going to have to wait for the traffic to go. Correct. Forward. But again, you're looking at one direction of traffic at a time. Each maneuver you make, you're looking at one direction. You're not having to process yeah, all the other information at the intersection. I think it's training the people to be able to use this again because there's, there's going to be accidents starting all over again. Yeah, it, it, It's very similar, like I said, to 4257 in Utah Street. It's really the exact same thing. The only thing that's different is we're allowing you to make that U-turn on the downstream side. So, you know, when you come out on Utah Street, you come out, you can only turn your vehicle to the right. You can't go straight across. You can't go left. So, really, from the intersection, it's going to look the exact same as what you see when you come to Utah Street. Now, on Utah Street, if you go north, you can't make a turn there. That's to go, correct. To go that, south. That's correct. That's where the difference will fall with the J-turn and what will we have at Utah. there be a J-turn there? Not at Utah Street. No, there will not be, no. That would be a good spot for one, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have the intersection of Michigan Street I live there. Off of Utah, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes they make a U-turn go right and right, right at Michigan Street. Yeah. yeah, which functions the same way. I mean, it's a legal U-turn to make. You know, yeah. there's a lot of fear in the world about U-turns because it's not a typical maneuver that people make. But actually, from a safety perspective, U-turns are a very safe maneuver to be made. People are just uncomfortable with them. But if you look at statistics, a U-turn is a very safe maneuver. Holly? Uh, I would say from, from my perspective, driving about 100 miles a day back and forth through there, that I think it's a good idea that it's, for those of us, we've d discussed this at my job, and it is scary through there. And John and I, well, I was telling John, you know, it, it is an issue, I think, that we need to correct. I never know who's going to come through that intersection, but you don't know through any intersection. But there, it really is scary because you just, all of a sudden, you come up and these people are coming across. So that's my thought on it, that I stay on the road a lot. Chuck? <coughs> yeah, I, I guess I, I, I've used this J-turn already in a city where it's on a 45-mile-an-hour road, and it's, it's something <coughs> that you get used to where you speed up and you hit the brakes and turn left and get in your turn lane. And the only issue I see with it is trying to educate people to uh, safely get across there and not drive it. 15 miles an hour because you're going a quarter of a mile to make a turn with somebody coming up 75 or 70 miles an hour behind you, even though it's 75, it's, you know, 65 posted. On a Friday. Uh, you know, that, I guess that's that, that's the only issue that I really see. With it. I, I I really you know support what you're coming up with, but uh, I see that as being a real learning curve. Yep, I, and I think it will be too. And I, you know, I'd say the one at 53 and B is on a 65 mile an hour. It's somewhat of a rec recreational route as well, going north south. Probably not to the extent that Dora County is, uh, but traffic volumes are pretty similar between those two locations. The one that's built and the one we're proposing here. Um, it's not nearly as much as the one we're building at 29 at VV. That's about double um, what we're talking here at this location. But go ahead, Ben. <clears throat> what are the impacts to? Uh Bicycles and pedestrians with J-turn intersections. Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, we have um, depressed the median to allow a bike to go across there. At other locations where we re restricted them, we try to keep it pretty narrow so a vehicle doesn't go through. Um, I've also talked with the fire chief, um, Mr. Vanderty, and uh, we've been talking closely too, and we're going to try to work with them as well from a fire response standpoint, since that's their water supply on the north side. So, I think we're going to make some provisions for that. Um, pedestrians obviously would be able to cross just like they can today, um, so it would be really no different for them. I don't, I don't know how much pedestrian traffic crosses there, but I mean, it would be similar as this today. Ken. Uh, I'll support this, <clears throat> but I do have concerns because like Dick, and I've gone over that intersection many, many times from every angle, I cannot see how there can be an accident there. 
but I'll support it because it's happening and mm -hmm. you're saying this is going to be better. But I do remember back to many, many years ago when I was capable of playing baseball, I hated that ball that was hit right at me. And now you're talking, we're going to be looking right at the traffic coming at us. That's the hardest thing to judge because you don't really know how close it is. Because it's right in front of you. From the side, anything at an angle, you could run that down like that. But when it's right in your face, you didn't know. And, and you're asking us to take that perspective. That's what we're going to be looking at. So I, I would worry about somebody pulling out more in that way than from the side. Sure. Just concern. Yep. Richard, um, I think the other thing that would really be bad is, is you have a lot of trailers, either from <coughs> trailers or camper trailers that are coming from the south to go to like Quiet Woods RV Center. So they're going to have to slow <coughs> way down, right? And they're going to be able to get their trailer out of the road to sit in the middle of the median, are they? So you're going to slow traffic down going north. So then the people going north, they're going to they're going to veer over to the right lane to avoid this this uh, camper trailer that's, I mean, these, some of these campers are 30, 40 feet. Yeah, I understand. And then you got boats that are 30, 40 feet that are. Yeah, I understand. I mean. I, I think it's not a good spot there at all for the type of traffic. I think if it was just cars there, it'd be different. Yeah. But when you got trailers and, you know, what about semi coming from Green Bay that's going <coughs> to turn to go to Brussels to drop off something? Yeah, and, and it's, that's a good question. They're going to be there's... sitting in the road with the trailer. And then the, these people aren't going to slow down for that trailer. They're going to veer over in the right lane. Now you're going to yeah. have an accident with the right lane. You know, yeah. I don't know. I yeah, don't the different vehicle types is a very good valid point. I mean, it's not only semis. It's not only campers. It's farm machinery. Yeah. Um, it's, there's other stuff that we have to deal with, and we understand that. You know, certainly at 23 and M, it's in a farming community, and I've met with numerous different farmers in that location. 29 and VV, we still have some farm, farming community out there as well. Um, but understand what a semi comes up northbound on C today. Let's say they go northbound on C and they make a right turn. They still pick an adequate gap. They're going at the first time when they enter that highway. They're going 5, 10. They're accelerating up. It takes them a long time to get up to speed. That turn is still going to happen today. That's not going to be any different. The only thing that's going to be different is they will make one lane change to the left sometime in that acceleration as they go to that J turn. But whether it's a, a camper, a bus, a semi, farm machinery, as they make that right turn, it's just like it is today um, if they're making that right turn. So nothing's really changed from that perspective other than they make one lane change over. Dale. Yeah, have you, um, I mean, this isn't going to happen this year, but, you know, on Sundays, leaving the county, there is a line of traffic. I mean, it's bumper to bumper. <laughs> is there going to be enough room to stack the vehicles in that J-turn lane? Yes. Um, Yes, I mean, we'll, we'll design it, and again, we haven't got to the engineering part of it, but we'll design it to ensure that we can maintain that queue out of the through stream of traffic. Yeah. They will not be stopped in the, in the lane of traffic, the live lane of traffic. They'll be out into their left turn lane, out of traffic, uh, sitting in a queue there, if there already is there any delay. So like a dozen cars and trailers can stack up? We'll, we'll build those left turns long enough to accommodate them. Yes, ma'am. How long has the highway been open now, the double? Uh, our data goes back to 2008, so I think it began right about in that time frame. I, I was so. going to say that I was the chairman of that <clears throat> safety highway committee before John, and there was a lot of accidents there, and we thought at that time that it would go down, but they've continued. And uh, there was a, one chart that you had on the highway from Sturgeon Bay to Green Bay. There's a number of intersections the same way. Every other one had five and six accidents, and this one had 25. So the bottom line is... You better do something, and this is the only solution other than nothing. So, but it's uh, uh, amazing how many the accidents have continued the last uh, what? 10 years. Are there, Mr. Chairman? Is there still as many accidents yep. now as there was when it first opened? Yep. Right. I mean, like four years or something, or what? Yeah, there is, and in fact, I, I was talking to the sheriff's department. Apparently, we had we don't get the crash reports right away, but apparently, we've had two in March alone again. So it's not going down. I don't see a trend going down at all. It's been very consistent. We had a little blurb when we did a bunch of those signing changes. I think maybe, Ken, when you were the chair, we did a bunch of signing changes. We had a little blurb where it dipped a little bit, but it's, it's right back up again. So I see no trend saying that this is, problem's going away. Go ahead. To me, I think what this is going to do, instead of getting hit from the side, you're going to get rear-ended. You know, and that's, you know, I don't know where you want to get hit. I, if I was sitting in the driver's seat, I'd sooner get hit on the right side, I think, than get rear-ended, but especially with a trailer and... Yeah, Na geez. Nationwide, yeah. from the ones that have been put in, uh, the crash reduction, 
um, for the right angle crashes obviously has been 100% because that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but overall, the overall crash rate has been dropping about 55 to 60%. So like I said, I'm not here to tell you that we're never going to go to a crash at this location again. Oh, no, it's going to happen. But we're going to significantly reduce the number of crashes and I expect the severity to go down as well because our vehicles are designed for a rear end impact much more than they are a side impact um, from a severity standpoint. But what you're going to have here is multiple crashes because we even have this semi sitting in the road and this guy's going to veer over to the right lane going north. Now he's going to hit the car over there maybe. Now the car behind him is going to hit him and the other one's going to go in a ditch. You're going to have a seven car pilot, you know, in my opinion. But yeah. And all I can tell you is the, about it than I do. The, the data from the ones that have been built that has not been the case. But. Any other questions? Looking for ben, a any, uh, the severity of the crash is, you know, is it, you know, from a cost effectiveness, uh, effectiveness um, perspective, it seems to me that, you know, if you're reducing the uh, number of crashes by 10 to 15 per year, um, the savings uh, from not having to rebuild vehicles and bodies, you know, thank goodness we haven't had a fatality <coughs> out there, but it seems to me that um, that this project will more than pay for itself and, uh, and those fewer uh, accidents. Do you think that's an accurate uh, way of looking at the situation? Yeah, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'm going to submit for a federal grant <clears throat> for safety, and that's basically what it's based on, exactly what you're saying, is how many crashes can we reduce based on how much it's going to cost us to do the, that. Mm -hmm. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, it'll go through no problem. I have no, no concerns whatsoever, be, just because what you're saying. The cost that we're going to spend to improve it is going to be far overweighed by the amount of crash reduction and the severity and the injuries that are going on. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thanks. I guess the next item is to go to the voter board and vote yes or no. Are we ready? <clears throat> Thank you. Young man. That is passed on a vote of 20 yes, and one no. So it's passed. Thank you, Scott, very much. So Next Mr. item Chairman. on the agenda is um, review and revision of, of the rules of order and duties of the standing committee. And I think we go ahead. We missed the Pledge of Allegiance? No. Okay. You missed it. <laughs> we did. No, we did. Excuse Charlie, me. Was standing up. I did. It's called a senior moment. Yeah. <laughs> senior moment. Oh <laughs> Are you okay? Just get the check. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Charlie, you can do it again. You got well, the we check. Well, I'm serious. Get the <laughs> Go ahead, Maureen. Uh, uh, so far, there's only one revision that we're talking about right now. Yes. Yes. Um, as the rules of order state, we can review the, or the county board can change their rules at any meeting. I think at one point we were talking about redoing the per diems and the meeting charges and the mileage. Uh, that item is not ready for you today, um, but it will be ready for you prior to um, December 1st of this year is when we need to take action on any review of revision to the per diems, the mileage, et cetera. Um, and we're still working on that. <clears throat> Pardon me. The team that's working on it is the Corporation Council, County Clerk, and myself. So we'll work that through the Administrative Committee. Um, I think in a month or two, we should have something to you uh, for your approval later on. The item that's before you today, however, is ready. Uh, this is um, a change to the way we do our vouchers. I think I've spoken at, at several of the committees about the need to do this. Uh, we do have Bill Shador in the room today. He is, of course, um, our champion on buy local. We can kind of call this rule revision pay local. Uh, what this is designed to do is <coughs> instead of for our, uh, the vendors that do business with us, they're waiting until a committee meets until they get paid. Right now, only about 20% of our vouchers are prepaid. And about 80% are waiting until the committees meet in order to, for those vendors to get paid. So this would be a way that we could uh, improve that ratio um, and still provide the much needed information for you all uh, to see what we are indeed paying. So this would be like we do today at the county board. We provide you a listing of the vouchers that have been paid. We'd be doing that same thing in committee rather than you pass around that big mountain of paper that you get each month. 
we we've looked back in prior records uh, I don't recall any ever seeing a time when we've held out a voucher because this again is services that have already been rendered mm -hmm. it's whether or not we pay it so this uh, new rule that's being offered to you would tighten that procedure it would allow the departments through budget documents that you've already approved you've authorized the spending each year as part of the budget uh, the departments would review it the department head would still be responsible for it the items would be submitted to the finance department on a twice monthly basis and we would be paying local we'd be doing that important function which is paying for the services <coughs> or whatever items that we're purchasing and then providing you a list of uh, the vouchers that we've paid that's what this rule will do good are there any questions oh, there's one more key piece to this though too we're uh, in new addition to this is that the finance director will pr be providing each committee a quarterly budget report um, so instead of looking at those monthly vouchers well you still will be able to you'd be looking at a listing of them instead of that full packet but you'd also be getting a quarterly budget report from the finance director on how that department is doing in terms of its budget to actual so that is the one addition that's new I'm sorry it's the last sentence so that's the one addition John uh, uh, reviewing the both of these I see no rule had a sentence in there that says approval of the oversight committee I don't see that in the new rule so does the oversight committee's role change in approving the vouchers? Yes, it does. It does? Yes. You'd be reviewing the voucher list after the bills have been paid. Right now, we, we and, wait. And if, and if they s decide not to pay one? What? I don't think that we'd be in that situation, but we wouldn't provide a service and not pay for it. But you would be, be get, you would be getting right now, the way the process is working, 20% of the vouchers are prepaid. It's just that that you, the county has allowed that to occur. 80% are waiting for that committee meeting, until we pay those folks that have provided a service to us. More often times, that's a small mom and pop, community-based residential facility. We're waiting. They're waiting until the committees are meeting until they get paid and of course we're moving the committees from one week to the next so there is a, a lag I, I've gotten phone calls uh, from one CBRF in particular wanted to go um, and take care of their business we're having a difficult time making their payroll because we moved a committee meeting um, so this is what that's designed to, to change it's your call if you still want the vouchers before your committee for approval we certainly can do that but then we won't be changing the rule to accommodate this efficiency Chuck yeah I, I guess uh, I've been on several committees where we have not paid a bill due to the work not being done properly uh, and it only came to our attention during the committee uh, that there was an issue with work being done and we said let's uh, go back and start over with not paying the bill and see what corrections are being made uh, to that project that we had done so I, I guess in this particular case I would see us losing that handle that we would have because by the time it came to our attention if it wasn't mentioned that committee uh, we would never discuss it until after the bill was paid I would hope that the department heads are properly reviewing bills that are. No kidding. I, would, I would say that that has happened, but it has happened because the department head has told you that was happening. And in this case, the department head has to approve it and has to be in the budget. And then it'll go to the finance committee and the finance committee will, I mean, the finance department will pay it. But, but that has happened. But I have never, ever seen a bill that because of a committee action has been totally refused if the department that the department had didn't know about you know what I mean I understand that but I think if uh, you look at some of the multitude of bills that come through some departments uh, not every department head is going to have an exact handle on it at the time uh, early on where sometimes uh, you recognize the fact shortly after that it it wasn't adequate okay Ken 
if somebody's make having a problem making payroll because they're not getting a payment from us not my problem if you're operating on a shoestring perhaps you better go back and uh, uh, think about whether you belong in business or not if it's that critical that's that's an argument that shouldn't be made here that's well, not our problem that's the business's problem for not being funded well enough I like it the old way where, where we on the committee level look the bills over and decided you're Thank taking you. more uh, bottom line Dan you're taking more away from us again here on the county board but what we're talking about here and I can respond to that we're talking about bills that go beyond 30 to 40 days to get paid and uh, a lot of businesses see what happens is that they get the bill it doesn't go to committee and it gets delayed and then it might not get paid for 45 days <clears throat> and I can speak from experience a lot of businesses don't have that much money in the coffer that they can go 40 to 60 days without getting their bills paid. That doesn't happen with every business. No, Again, I'm not saying that's it does. not our okay. concern. Our okay. concern is is the taxpayers here and whether we're getting like like Chief <clears throat> says whether we're getting a job well done. And if you're going to go well, yeah, without the committee's well. review and pay a bill, and the committee finds out after it's been paid we're not happy with it, I'm telling you, <laughs> somebody that's operating on a shoestring like that isn't going to be willing to come back and satisfy us after they've gotten their paycheck either. You don't think that the county should pay within 30 days though? Do we not pay in a timely manner? I'm, that's correct. That's what I'm asking. That, that's Do what we this, not pay in a timely manner? That's what manner? this is about is that sometimes because of the alignment of the bills coming in and the alignment of the committee approving and the alignment of the check getting out from the county is some days can go to 45 to 50 <coughs> days before the person in business gets their money. And if I could. Uh, this is not an attempt to to take anything away from the county board. This is a an attempt to streamline <coughs> items. You'd still be getting a listing of the vouchers that were paid. You'd still be you'd in addition to the voucher issue. You'd also be getting a quarterly budget report on budget to actual. There are some committees that are not getting that report. So it's a, it's an effort to provide you with better information. Um, the quarterly budget report is important. You know that's an important tool that. Even we could go to a monthly budget to actual report. Uh, that's the key piece to look at this from a policy making macro level um, as opposed to the vouchers that are something that are approved as part of the budget process and it's generally speaking for services that have been rendered. A department head level issue. But whatever your choice is your choice. Um, if this is something that you wish not to change it's unfortunate. Um, but we'll just bring this back to you in a, in a year or so and we'll try again. It really is an item that uh, we have a lot of our staff that are are processing those payments for your committee and this is an, an attempt to streamline. That's really what it is and still provide you with the information. It would indeed be after they're paid but to provide you with that voucher listing and then in addition provide you with that all important budget to actual report on a quarterly basis. Thank you. you. I would uh, somewhat concur with um, <clears throat> with Kenny in regards to uh, being well funded to work. But you know, if I was in a business that worked for the county, and the county pays every 50 days, but once it's the the, <clears throat> the first payment's there, it's every 30 days. Ken, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'd agree with you there. But I also feel that uh, Marine's position here is <clears throat> probably uh, a sound one because first off. If there was something controversial, like maybe Chuck was bringing up, the department head just wouldn't pay that automatically. But most of these bills, repetitive <coughs> bills, month by month by month by month, mm -hmm. and those people just should be paid. We shouldn't have to fiddle with something like that. It's just like, you know, every April 15th, you got to pay your taxes. Well, you just, you know, you got to understand that some bills are just repetitive month by month, and just crazy to have to bring them back to committee to look at them again. I think. Ms. <clears throat> yeah, just a comment. I, I am on a committee where the department had challenged a bill for a service that was done and felt that we were being gouged. And that particular business submitted a new bill, substantially less. But that was handled by the department head basically, but he brought it to the attention of the committee and the committee concurred that this, this bill, after it was explained what they actually did, and what the bill was, it, it, it was too much money. So, in a way, I, you know, I don't, this is kind of like a rubber stamp, like the stuff is going to go through, but 
the department head has to do, you know look at it closely and then they submit it to the finance committee and then the burdens on the finance committee which is just a, you know a handful of the county board so I, I i guess my the bottom line is nothing is perfect but uh, there are there are bills that come through that are they shouldn't be paid they're they're too high and and they should be questioned before they're paid it's a very valid point. The, uh, when the county board chair saw the first draft of this, that first paragraph was not in there. The department head shall screen all bill bills and invoices because that's just a natural part of being a department head. But it was a very important addition because uh, the county board chairman looked to that piece being in black and white so that there is no, um, sec no second get or no, that has to be in black and white so that you know what's happening. That's why that paragraph was put in there. I look at that as just, that's an automatic. Department heads, of course, are looking at their bills. That's what we entrust them to do when we adopt a budget, is to look over their bills and make sure that they're spending the money that we trusted them to spend as part of the budget process. Um, but it was a very important add, because uh, as you notice, this memo is coming from the county board chairman and the administrator. And I also could tell you that, uh, I don't know how many times we've been at finance and administrator, and you see the bills, and not everybody goes through them all. So in fact, most of them aren't even gone through. Okay. You know, so it's really up to the department heads to call your attention to a bill that's not proper. So, go ahead, Mark. I think you kind of everybody said what I need to say, but this is basically simply saying, you hired the department heads, you gave them a budget, they need to follow it something's not right they bring it to our attention they they know what to do with that they you know everybody's already even the people arguing against this have actually argued for it because they've stated the reasons why this will work but you need to trust your department heads you need to trust they'll bring things to your attention anything that I've ever seen at committee level that's been a problem was brought to me by my department head not I didn't know what was going on they did so we're just <laughs> trusting them to do their jobs and I think every department head in the county, if what that goes to the level in their department of the person that's incurring that bill, if there's a problem with it, to find out what that bill is and what, what's going on there. You know, because as Chuck said, every department head has a lot of bills, but that's what they have supervisors, and they go down the level to find out what the bills are. I think we need to trust the people we pay to do their jobs. Thank you. Dick, uh, I was on a committee that uh, also there was a, bill that was paid like six months ahead of time. It was only like six or eight thousand dollars, but the equipment wasn't going to be here for six months. You know, I said, well, why are we paying for that now? You know, well, it's, you know, we're going to get it and it's going to get, you know, it's paid. So, but I got overruled, but whatever, I didn't think we needed to pay that six or eight thousand bucks six months ahead of time. You know, but so that happens the other way too. Anybody else? Dale. I, I tell you, uh, listening to people about talking about a company's being on a shoestring after requesting a payment within two weeks or within 30 days, waiting for 45 days, being on a shoestring is totally wrong. For instance, if you're in the fuel business and you order and you, you deliver a load of fuel and you wait for 45 days, you're not going to be a business for a long time because that's an awful lot of money sitting out there and you're not getting paid for. It's not because you're in bad business. So people deserve to get paid. If you get paid semi-monthly, that'd be great. I think it's going to be less uh, work for actually the finance uh, people mm -hmm. when they start a rotation like this. Mm -hmm. um, when you do a service right now and you go to someone's house, for instance, in an HVAC thing, you, you want payment right away so you can keep the trucks on the road and keep, keep the people employed. You know, Waiting 30 days, 45 days, missing that, that mark and sometimes two months to get paid, I don't think is right. So I think we have a responsibility to people who do business with. <coughs> Plus, it might people look at this and say, you know what, maybe I will do business with the county now because I will get paid in a timely manner. Ben? I want to uh, agree with Dale that uh, I, I, I feel the county should be a responsible member of the business community and, and pay our bills in a timely manner. Waiting for bills to be paid you know, uh, after a committee meeting, you know, I've never, in my experience, uh, seeing a county board member, including myself, pull a bill out and and say, here's one we should not pay, and have a really good valid reason for it. You know, that's it's never happened. Um, the only time, 
the only discussion around vouchers uh, seems to be a, a more inquisitive in nature. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we uh, fixed the uh, the axle on the Taurus. You know, is it is it gonna is it going bad? You know, you know, and and we have a a, a brief line of questioning uh, about that particular issue before moving on and and uh, and passing the vouchers. But I think the I think we're we're trading off a little micromanaging here for some really good uh, data about what our budgets are doing on a quarterly basis. That is such a better measure of of how we're doing as a as a department and in our and in our oversight committee. You know, I'm I'm very much in favor of it. My only disappointment is that I hadn't thought of it sooner. <laughs> and you still will be getting that important voucher list. So you, there, there still will be that review of the voucher yeah. list, but it will yeah. it will only occur after the payment's been made. That's the only right. difference here. And I guess so you're only, still getting that in from both pieces. The only thing I see changing is that uh, the businesses in our community that are relying on payment from us will get it in a timely manner instead of whenever, <coughs> which has I, been our I policy would, up to now. I would add to that that um, Almost all the people we do business with are uh, reputable people, and if it was found that the bill was paid and there was an error, that then you'd contact that person and they'd certainly readjust it. The fact is, I'll bet you that of all the bills you've approved, I bet you 70 percent of them have been paid before you approved them. Yeah, they did. Over the last number of years, so they're not. A lot of them are paid, and you don't even realize it. Would this include Ace Hardware? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to go down that road. I don't own it, so I don't know. Yeah. I got nothing to do with you. So go ahead, Ken. Uh, just a question: How long have we not been paying on a timely manner? Because Dale and Ben are both saying we are not paying their statements. I can say for I can say for the last 35, manner. 40 years. And, and yeah. if that's the case, then I'd certainly say yes. Go I ahead. can say it for the last 35 to 40 years, the 45 years. We through don't experience. pay in a timely manner. Well, what, what I call a timely matter, you send the bill, I'll give you an example. You send it, since he brought it up, you send a bill out, it comes in, you send it out the first of the month, it doesn't get the committee, then it goes beyond the end of the month, it doesn't get paid, then the computers automatically tack on an interest charge, mm -hmm. and the bill comes again to the county at plus the interest charge, and then the county calls you up and says, we do not pay interest charge, so then you got to make a debit because they do not pay interest charges on government things, and it has happened over the last... 30 to 35 to 40 years. And we've been doing that all the time. Yes. Yeah. So, well, you didn't say that to start with. Well. But if you're not a, you should be in business, they can figure it out. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> your business, you figure it out. My businesses survive. <laughs> anyway. Well, you don't work with the company. It's, it's a rock solid business. <laughs> like Ben said, he, he wished he would have thought of this earlier. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions? John. I guess I just want to say one more thing. I am all in favor of paying our bills on time. That's not the issue here. And I am 100% believing in our department heads. That's not the issue here. I'm all for that. I guess I have a hard time, once again, as elected official, you are releasing some of your power to govern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Big deal. You, you still are going to see the bills and can uh, disagree with them. And The word approval. Okay. It's removed. Okay. Anything else? You ready? Oh, we, I, we have to have a motion to approve this uh, rule order number 11 and uh, retain all the other rules of orders and duties of the standing committees that we already have. So I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the revision of rules of order number 11. I'll second it. And, we'll, and you're going to add uh, retain the rules and duties of the standing committees that we already have? Mm -hmm. Yes, and retain the duties of standing committees we have. Okay. Second, Second. by Roy. Any other questions? If not, we'll go to the voter board and okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. This has, a question, hold on, hold on. has a question. Mr. Chairman? Yes. But I think it should be noted that we are going to make changes to the rules of order in this term yet before December 1st. Like Marine says, we can make rules of order change anytime we want to. And that the payroll one that we're talking about will come up before we have to take out nomination papers. And that would become <laughs> effective when the new board sits in April of 14. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Now you can vote. <laughs> Majority. 
Mm -hmm. Richard. That is a pass on a vote of 19 yes and two no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Correspondence. Uh, in your packet is a couple letters. Um, basically, uh, a letter complimenting from uh, uh, Paul, Paul Graf on um, the people that took over for and helped out um, George Penny when he was sick. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, one from the Liberty Grove town and uh, the town of Bailey Harbor supporting the uh, resolutions coming up on the uh, fire alarm. Fire. Uh, oh, FEMA grant. Yeah. And then uh, the unassigned balance <coughs> in your packet. <coughs> Anybody got any questions? I go ahead. I have uh, also received a letter in support of the fire grant coming up from the town of Jacksonport and all supported that also. Okay. So we're doing the public comment. Does anybody in the public have a comment? Took us a long time. Hi. Good morning. Victoria Serenich. I'm from Sevastopol and I'm here as an observer for the League of Women Voters along with Barb Graal. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, we'll go to um, the special reports on the J-turn we've already given. The Door, Door County Economic Development Corporation, um, Bill Schudewer is here to speak on it. Uh, as of now, there are 11 people that have signed up to go to uh, legislative days from the county board and uh, uh, that's closed. And just to go to the annual meeting bill, um, you have today to sign up for the annual meeting on Tuesday, April 30th. We're going to have county board, but we're going to recess about 11.30, go to the meeting, and then come back here if we're not done. Um, you have today to sign up uh, if you want the county to uh, pay for your meal. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, I guess I'll answer any questions. As you know, uh, our annual meeting, um, we have uh, Congressman Reed Ribble as our keynote speaker. He's going to talk about the economy and his efforts to try to uh, stimulate the economy uh, through congressional actions. Uh, we also presented a couple of awards that day, Entrepreneur of the Year and Industry of the Year. So uh, we always get a good turnout. We appreciate the county's support uh, for all these years, and we appreciate your, your participation in our annual meeting. Can I answer any questions you might have? No questions? Easy. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Um, you have in your packet the uh, annual reports. Um, it's uh, hundreds of pages long. We could go through it page by page. You're going to read it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I suggest that uh, each department, uh, each uh, department chairman, take it to their committees and review them. Marine, you have. Yes. Anything? First and foremost, I would like to thank Lori Holtz for her help with this. Uh, she is the accumulator of the annual report for your review. Um, and just to point out, I used to be able to say A to Z in the last county that I worked for. We're a B to V county. We have a building to a veteran services. So actually, we do have an airport, but we've thrown it in with the parks. But we still are working on getting that Z. Uh, it's important, valuable information about the status of the various departments and the services that they provide. Um, if anyone wishes to get a hard copy, please let me know and we'll get you a hard copy. Um, but thank you to Lori Holtz for her work, diligent work with this. So I'd urge every committee chairman to uh, at least review the annual report of their various committees. <laughs> Motion to accept the minutes of March 26, 2013 regular meeting. So moved. Motion by Mark, yes, seconded by Richard Haynes. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Um, <clears throat> we have a presentation of family care status updates. Susan, you're going to give us that, that update? Excuse me, Cletus, I'm going to give you my back here for a second. Um, we just wanted to give you an update as to where this was in terms of legislation. Okay. You, you remember that in January we passed, in January we passed a resolution as a county board asking that we be treated the same as the other 57 counties and get the benefits from family care. Uh, when the budget came out, it, Governor Walker had not included it in the budget and indicated that he would refer to the legislators to make the decision about this. 
And so at that point, the county's representatives from the seven counties met a couple of times to try to plan for how to make sure that did happen at joint finance. Uh, one of the things that happened after the first meeting was we contacted the media, and there were a number of um, media uh, stories that went out after that. Dan and Maureen and Joe Krebsbach and myself met with Representative Gary Byes. He told us that he supported this, and he actually went on record the following week on Eddie Allen's interview show, speaking about its importance and that he was working on it. Uh, Maureen communicated with Senator Lassay, um, who indicated that if it comes before him, he will vote for it. Dale attended WCA's regional meeting to see what was going on with it. And then a group of us testified at the Joint Finance <coughs> Committee hearing at Lambeau Field on the 8th. Mark and Dale, Maureen, Joe Miller, who is a citizen representative on the Human Services Board, Tom Crick, who's a citizen representative on the Long-Term Support Committee, uh, Shirley Senarigi, who, who spoke in favor of family care on behalf of the League, and myself. Dale distributed your resolution to the committee. I distributed a very nice letter that Ben wrote as chairman of the Long-Term Support Committee, and there were representatives from other counties as well. It also was submitted as a legislative days issue. What we have been told, however, is even if the hearing's done, we have to keep the pressure up as joint finance goes forward and deliberates about this, discusses it, and makes decisions. Um, we found out yesterday that Representative Byes has prepared an amendment to the Joint Finance Committee to establish it, and he will be working with a member of Joint Finance to introduce it. We are very grateful for that. That is very important. Um, a letter from the counties, seven counties, will be sent in support of his amendment to that, um, and a letter from the human services directors will be sent to, in the seven counties, will be sent to Department of Health Services. Copies of all those going to the various legislators. So what we're, we wanted you to know where we were. We wanted you to know that anything you can do, you know, to keep this a full court press, um, if you know people on joint finance, we'll be happy to provide you with a list of that. If you know any other legislators who will eventually vote on this budget um, when it comes to the floor, um, please, we ask for your continuing support. And any emails, any phone calls, anything will can only help us. It's really very unfair where we are now, and we don't want to let this drop. So. Yes, and an important to thank Gary Byes. Uh, he has much. been very loyal to the county. Any questions? Dale? So I want to uh, comment on that. Our last issue of the uh, WCA Counties Magazine, uh, one side of it is transportation. You flip it over to the other side, concerns human services. And there's a very good article about family care there uh, presented by WCA, which I was kind of surprised to see. But there's some good figures in there, and one of the, one of the uh, main issues they have there is we're not being treated equal <clears throat> as far as the other counties throughout the state of Wisconsin are. So everybody's got it except for a few counties, and I think it's if, if we can all contact our, our legislators or whoever, any legislation you know, please do. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, we'll go down to the resolutions. Uh, the first one is 2013-18 Door County Revolving Loan Fund Application Drink Coffee LLC. Dick Haynes, you want to explain this and make a motion to? Uh, I will. Uh, is Bell still here back there? Y yes, he is. Uh, I'll maybe in. I was out of town for that last meeting. Okay, so you want to make a motion? And I will make the motion. Is there a yes. second? Yeah, but <coughs> maybe Bell can explain. Second it by that. Mark Fairston. Go ahead, Bill. <coughs> Sure. Uh, again, as you know, we're coming back to the Revolving Loan Fund Committee to recommend approval of another loan through the County Revolving Loan Fund. This is to Drink Coffee, which is a Sister Bay business. Basically, it's uh, an opportunity for the business to grow. They're uh, uh, moving a couple blocks uh, from their current location. They've been in business eight years now. It's a small restaurant in Sister Bay. They'll be adding a couple of employees. Uh, they'll be purchasing a building. They're in the process of renovating that building. We're going to be financing some uh, new equipment for that restaurant operation. Uh, we have the standard security requirements that will be met. So we, uh, the committee is recommending this loan. It's a loan of about $35,000. Does anybody got any questions? Hmm? David? I just have one, Mr. Chairman. First of all, it's great to see a Sister Bay business work with the Door County Economic Development. 
uh, group. <laughs> uh, secondly, on the fiscal Bias impact, there. it lists the impact as $90,000, and perhaps that needs to be corrected to coincide with the amount listed in the resolution. Is that a typo? The, the 90000 is the match the, 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 uh, the, uh, that the business is putting up, $90,000 in, uh, in private financing. So that's above and beyond the 35 that the city, the county will be providing. Right, but on the fiscal impact, it says the financing is 90,000. That would be incorrect. Oh, financing would be 35,000. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, that's just a typo. I hope. <coughs> we'll change that then. Any questions? Are you ready for the voter board? Free samples. Are you ready? Put the low. Okay. Go to the voter board and vote yes or no. I said yes. Okay, it passed 21 to 0. Like Next it. item on like the agenda not. is the Door County Revolving Loan Program Policies and Procedures Manual. Uh, Bill, I hope you can explain this simplistically. <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, again, as you know, uh, uh, this, we've been operating, the county has had this revolving loan fund program for a number of years. Uh, you've adopted uh, uh, throughout the years uh, the original policies and then some amendments along the way that, that guide the committee and the county and how this program works and what kinds of eligible businesses are available and what are, what are ineligible uses. And so it lays out all the, the the policies that govern this program. For the most part, these policies uh, are, were originated by the state and federal governments that originally capitalized this loan fund for us. So uh, we've tweaked it with some local local uh, uh, policies as well, but for the most, I would say probably 99% of that is mandated by the state and federal government. So the, the change we're asking you to approve today is another mandate by the state and federal government. Frankly, the, it's originated with HUD. It concerns two issues. <laughs> Uh, one is the, um, the jobs be filled by low to moderate income folks, and the second one is an anti-pirating job provision, which basically restricts a business from capitalizing on this program to move jobs from one county to another. So that's not the purpose of this program. It's to uh, help businesses grow or to start, not to move jobs from one county to the other. So that's now pro prohibited specifically, and the low to moderate income um, job requirement change basically is how that how a business has to document that they went out of their way to try to hire folks that qualified as low and moderate income. Right, remember these originally uh, federal HUD monies, CDBG, uh, Community Development Block Grant monies from the feds to the state. State lent them to a county business and that county paid them back It went into the county fund. That's how this program originally got capitalized. So the feds have uh, overriding jurisdiction on this program, so we have to follow the rules. This is a mandated rule change. The, the state, uh, uh, the feds made this change a number of years ago. The state has finally gotten around to mandating our community revolving loan funds, uh, change their policies to comply. So is this going to be a good change for the program? No. It's going to make it more difficult and more challenging for businesses to take advantage of the program. There's extra steps involved in the hiring process. Um, to fill jobs that are helped being created by this program. So it's not something we voluntarily are doing. It's something that's mandated on us. We have no choice. We have to do it. The solution to the challenge that they're putting in front of us is uh, going to require another solution, another change. And I'm working with my colleagues in Northeast Wisconsin on that right now. We've been working on this change for the last six months. Basically, the, the way we can eliminate this pro this new change as well as some of the other burdensome rules that come with this program are is by regionalizing this fund. Instead of being a county fund, we're going to be coming back to you in a few months with a proposed change that it becomes regionalized. So it'll be an eight county fund. And that will allow us to what they call defederalize this program. So this job requirement that focuses on low to moderate income folks will go away. Uh, a rule, another rule that we have that is burdensome as a federal Davis-Bacon rule, which requires uh, any labor funded with these funds to be uh, uh, pay prevailing wage rates. Basically, those wage rates are, are Milwaukee wage rates, construction wage rates, and not, not local wage rates. So frankly, we consequently, and there's a ton of paperwork involved in, in implementing that. So we basically have a policy where we don't fund construction. 
So these are examples of rules that we hope to have go away. And there are going to be other benefits. They're going to, they're, we're going to have access to uh, bigger pots of money. We're going to still retain local approval authority for the uh, for up to loans of up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. We'll still have a county fund that will approve those, uh, but and then it'll be a fund, a regional fund that we'll be able to tap into for larger projects. Uh, we'll also, because we'll be administering this on a regional level now in the future, we'll be ac uh, available to have uh, um, uh, credit anal analysts. We'll be able to have some staff that'll provide some more professional level review of the loan applications and the businesses credit worthiness. So there's a number of changes that will come with the regionalization. I'm not here to, to, to propose that to, to you today. We're still working on those rules. I think we're a couple months away from those changes. But I'm telling you that now so you know that there is some hope. Even though we're making the program less attractive to businesses today, there's a hope in a couple months that we, those, those challenges will go away. Sorry for the long explanation, but it's it is what it is. Okay, I need a motion for pass the resolution 2013-19, and I'll just read the, now therefore be resolved that the Door County Board of Supervisors does hereby accept the recommendation of Door County Loan Review Committee to approve the revision to the Door County Revolving Loan Program Policies and Procedures Manual as presented. So I need a motion. I'll make that motion. Motion by Richard Haynes, Second. seconded by Kathy. I can see you. Is there any questions? Hugh. I have a question for you. I just kind of read through this stuff. It says, it, now re, the red is changes, right? Correct. It says, three years of financial history, including balance sheets, profit loss statements, cash flow, account notes, stuff like this. That's, uh, doesn't really matter where it is. But here's the, here's the point I like to try and make is, a lot of kids graduate from college, and they have a degree in a certain thing, and they try and go to get a job. They don't have any experience. And so they can't, it's kind of a catch-22. They have the proper training, but they don't have the experience. And so, to me, these funds were given out are to help local people establish new jobs. And most of these people don't have three years' experience. Right. Do you see what I mean? Well, we certainly do start up businesses. <laughs> we help start up businesses with this fund. We're saying if you are in business for have had, if you have three years of experience, we want to see the financials. If you don't have it, well, we I mean, want to see just your make business. an overview of the point I'm trying Pardon? to make. It. For instance, to drink coffee, the interest rate was four percent, as I recall correctly. I didn't right. go back and look mm -hmm. it up. You know, that's not a real bonus rate. That's not, you know, something you get at a bank. So if you have to put three years of experience in and go to the bank and 4%, you might as well just go to the bank. I don't see the advantage of what you're offering at this point in time. Well, frankly, the, the, you know, restaurants, uh, this is a restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, restaurants are very, very difficult to finance these days. They probably would not even qualify for, for conventional bank financing uh, today. Uh, I'm, 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 just, I'm not speaking of drink. I'm talking about restaurants in general, unless mm -hmm. they're... Very, very successful. But drink for, coffee's been an established business yeah. for yeah. a long time in yeah. Sister Bay. So the private financing they have involved in that case is, is, a, is, a, is a land contract. So there is no bank financing involved in that project. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm telling you that that is a, a good deal given the size of the loan, given the, uh, the collateral that was pledged. The committee weighs all that when they, can, when they set the interest rate. It's, if it was a, a, a kind of a no-brainer safe loan, you might have seen a lower interest rate. But uh, the interest rate is, reflects the benefits. In this case, they're creating two jobs versus the risk. In this case, it's a small business. Uh, um, you know, um, and the, the committee deliberated. They spent a lot of time considering the, the, that setting of the interest rate. We've done as, less, as low as 2%, sometimes even maybe even as low as 1% loans in the past. But I guess I'm asking you to trust the committee that they considered all that and are recommending what they think is the right rate for that particular business. So what you're telling me is the business is more risky than some other business, right? Correct. So <coughs> it's kind of like a catch-22. You're charging them more for a risky business. The important thing you is they're getting a loan yeah. that they probably don't have another source to go to. So that the county is, you know, you've done a few restaurants now. And frankly, uh, if it wasn't for your loan program, these restaurants probably would not have been able to to expand. Yeah. So you, you need to be proud of the fact that you've had a role in, in uh, the, the Blue Horse in Fish Creek was another example. Probably wasn't going to qualify. Well, it's a great program. I'm just saying I think the loan should be easier to get in, lo in less terms. If that's what the money's for is to finance upstart we, we have to weigh that, Hugh, versus getting the money paid back. And that's, you know, you, you want the money paid back. Frankly, we right now have a loan that's in default that, that we're working with Grant and trying to collect as best we can. Mm -hmm. So with the committee, that's their challenge is to, 
uh, review financials till they are sure that there's a very good chance of getting the money paid back. It's versus that versus providing a stimulus to help them make it happen. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we have, just like a bank has to, has to weigh. So are there any other questions? No. Border board ready? Mm -hmm. Go to the border board. Thank you, Bill. You bet. Thank you. That is passed 21 to zero. Next item is the um, <coughs> Federal Emergency Management Agency grant for a simulcast paging system. Um, David, it's your thank, turn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to make a motion that we approve resolution 2013-20. Okay, seconded by Dale. The, if you read through your literature, this is a Sister Bay Liberty Grove Fire Department has applied for a grant, is anticipated being awarded a grant for $1.125 million to implement a simulcast paging system throughout the county. Some of the monies that we currently have in our tower project that we funded last year for $2.4 million include equipment that would be covered by this grant. What Sister Bay Liberty Grove Fire Department is asking for, they have to come up with a $125,000 matching grant to accept the, the, the grant, or matching dollars to accept the grant. Uh, they're asking that we would supply that $125,000 matching grant. So what we're proposing in this resolution is that we cost shift money that's currently in the budget in this $2.4 million tower project and repay um, Sister Bay Liberty Grove up to $125,000 for equipment that we would be putting on our towers anyway. If you kind of go through the numbers that follow this on the sheet that uh, was supplied by IS and Tim, there's between four hundred and fifty and four hundred and seventy thousand dollars in equipment that would fall under this grant uh, that would be a cost benefit to the county that we wouldn't have to pay for because the grant would pick up those dollars. In exchange, we would provide the hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollar matching matching dollars back to Sister Bay Liberty Grove Fire Department as the grant recipient. And that's the long and the short of it. I'm sure that I believe I saw Chris Heck from Sister Bay Liberty Grove Fire Department in the back, and I believe Tim is here also. If there's other questions. Has anybody got any questions? Wonderful. <laughs> we'll go to the border board then. Okay. Ready? That is passed twenty one to zero. Uh, next item, David, do you want to explain the um, I don't know if that's you or the, the approval of the agreement between Sister Bay and Liberty Grove, maybe Grant? Grant. Grant, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, very briefly, uh, Resolution 213-21 uh, follows on the heels of 213-20, the one you just adopted, and it is the agreement between uh, Door County and the Sister Bay and Liberty Grove Fire Department uh, that allows the two to cooperate uh, with respect to the FEMA grant. And uh, in terms of the uh, nuts and bolts of the agreement, uh, this is similar to one that we entered into with the uh, village, with Ephraim a few years back. Uh, the grant T, in this case, the Sister Bay and Liberty Grove Fire Department, has to take ownership of the equipment that is funded by the grant for the minimum period required under the grant, which is typically one year. At the end of that one year period, uh, Door County would then assume ownership of the equipment funded through the grant, and that is spelled out in the one page cooperative agreement, which is page 39 uh, on the electronic version. If anybody has any questions, I can answer those maybe. I we'll get a motion to put it on the floor. Uh, motion by moved over. Mark Miller, seconded by Hugh. Is there any questions? Ready? Yeah. Border board time. <laughs> We're going to stop right now. That is passed on the vote of 21 to 0. Next item is a proclamation from Travel Tourist Week. Um, this is given to us by the Door County Visitors Bureau. Yes, if those of you that are, are probably aware, as part of my position as administrator in Door County, I serve on the Visitors Bureau. The key piece to this resolution is line 17 to line 19. Uh, 
direct tourism spending totaled $271 million in Door County in 2011 and generated $30 million in state and local tax revenue while supporting 2,921 jobs and generating $62.3 million in employee wages. We all know that our economy is based on a three-legged stool being made up of tourism, agricultural, and industry. Um, it's important that we support tourism in any way that we can. And this will uh, support, as if you approve this resolution before you today, you will support and promote May 4th to May 12th as Travel and Tourism Week in Door County and urge all citizens in Door County to join in this special observance with appropriate events and commemorations. Thank you. I need a motion. Motion by Hugh, seconded by Joel. Any questions? I like to resolve. Ready? Yeah. Order board. <coughs> Go ahead, Leo. Got her. Lino. Hey. Oh, I thought I did, sorry. That is passed 21 to 0. Uh, Next item on the agenda is uh, we're going to take a break after the next item. So just so you know, is the uh, County Roads Bridges Fund transfer non-budgeted funds. David, you have the challenge. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 2013-24, the County Roads and Bridges Fund transfer of non-budgeted funds. I will second that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, second. Motion by David Lino, seconded by Ken Fisher. We were, finance was asked by the Highway Department to transfer funds from the Roads and Bridges funds uh, to continue making preventive maintenance and road improvements on county highways. Uh, the amount we've been asked for is a transfer of $161,270. It was discussed at finance, approved by finance, and moved to the county board. Are there any questions? You. I believe, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, the highway crews, if this money is not approved, will have a series of layoffs. Is that correct, David? That's our understanding, yes. And all uh, it seems to me the other department, uh, this is, those layoffs were put in place to, in, for this current year's budget, to attain funds for this current year's budget or retail, or curtail spending. Is that true or not? There is some confusion with that, Hugh. Yeah. In our budget, if you would recall, when we passed it, for this year, we included funding for all the personnel across all departments at 100%. And we took some unassigned funds from the unassigned fund balance and put them into the budget uh, for that purpose. What was not put in, my understanding is, and perhaps John could, could add detail, my understanding was that the county as an oversight, the highway department, did not include all of the maintenance funds um, and use of equipment Etc. because it had been less the year before when they did have layoffs, and so they did not increase that maintenance fund enough to cover its use this year. That's a make it. Go ahead. Susan? So can you follow that? So because of that, there wasn't enough work? I, because of that, they, John, again, my understanding is they were trying to make up the loss of those funds and we're going to implement layoffs in order to, in order to okay, make it thank you. Correct. Is there any other questions? Well, can I just ask David one more question? Sure. If you were in the planning department as an example and you had your hours curtailed from 40 to 38, would, you, would this be fair that you're getting the same treatment in the highway department as the planning department? Do you follow that? I'm sorry, say that again. In the planning department, as an example, the work hours of the zoning administrators were curtailed. I, I don't see that, that there's not a similarity between what we're doing here and what's happening there. That if I was in the planning department and was asked to curtail my hours, am I getting shortchanged by the highway department? I don't know if I can respond that, that it's the same issue or no. that, it, that it parallels. Go ahead, Dale. Well, I will uh, tell you something here that uh, as you drive around the county and look at our roads, they definitely do need work. And I think this is going to help improve the highway system that in our local roads here. So I'm, I'm, I would agree that we would, this is a good transfer. 
I guess that what I would add, maybe this goes to the part of what he was saying, <coughs> and Susan was saying. Last year, when the when the highway department went through layoffs, there was a number of preventive maintenance, routine maintenance things that did not occur when those 38 employees plus were not working. So this year, if they do the same thing to save money because the maintenance dollars were not increased this year, you'll have two years of 38 people not doing routine maintenance on the county road. So at some point in time, you're going to the laws of diminishing return is you don't keep your maintenance requirements, you're going to end up paying more dollars in the long run. So the highway department is asking, can we put the maintenance funds back in, avert the layoffs, and let them do the routine maintenance? Are there any other questions? Susan? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So this money is going in, and it's to pay for supplies and equipment? Is that what you're saying? For or maintenance funds to do maintenance on the road. So it's not salary. It's, it's sure, equipment. salary. It's salary. Right. Any other questions? I think it is. Leo, is that a hand? Yes. Go ahead, speak. Oh, he's um, I oppose this from the beginning, and I let a number of highway committee members know that I did not support it. And I did so by email because I was out of town. However, I don't know how it all falls in line, but I do know that somewhere along the line, in the negotiating process, other employees were asked to contribute more towards their health insurance. And in highways, they opt to take a furlough to meet that same requirement. Now, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But I think I was part of the part of the push on that one. I could go on forever, but I equate this now. I was told that the salaries are there to pay the men and ladies. But we need to get the dollars together so that we can provide the product for them to make the repair. I look at it like having someone come to my house and build a deck. <laughs> Do I pay them because I have that pot of money that I can? And then just leave it go because I can't afford to build a, buy the lumber to, con to construct that deck? I look at, at this in total as being a, we have this pillow mattress that the chairman always talks about, <laughs> the slush fund otherwise known, story. and the monies are there. <laughs> now you want to take the money from the bridge and roads to transfer it in there and make everybody whole, and the whole thing is great. It was that many years ago, Gady Road, Roy, had to have a, a new bridge. And I think that one done a cost overrun. So what happens in the event that we, and for those that don't know, we as a county, share costs, any kind of bridges, including culverts over 30 inches, um, we share costs out with the municipality in which the bridge needs to be repaired. What happens if we have a collapse of something and we have to do it again? Do we go back into the general fund and look for money to do it? As I said before, the deck cannot be built if I don't have the money to do it. I agree. I think their agreement was we don't want to pay the 15%. We'll take that furlough. I think I was part of that agreement as were a whole bunch of other guys here. And I think we we're going to make ourselves. Look really bad if we just allow this to go for that purpose. 
And I know Mr. Fisher is just waiting for me to say <laughs> No, sir, I am fighting my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, does that mean that towns will not have uh, be allowed to apply for assistance on replacing culverts? No. I don't think so. I don't think that answers them. Am I correct, John? They have to be over uh, 30 inches. Yeah. So we just can't build a deck. That's you just can't build a deck, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that that enters into this at all. I don't think that, that, that doesn't enter into it, Mr. That's some type of I think it, it just doesn't. Yeah. yeah, that's another issue. Okay. Yeah. It's the Florida it is. See this. I think you're sitting on the highway committee. I think it was our original thinking that this would come out of the unassigned fund balance, but uh, finance director was there and indicated that this fund, and I don't, you know, it's called the highway bridges and culverts. My initial reaction at that time, it wasn't the uh, culvert fund, it was a, another fund besides that. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, highway committee members are here. Go ahead, Ken. It's the county roads, county roads and bridges fund. Okay, don't worry about the bridges or the culverts, it's the county roads. And what we are asking for here is to do routine maintenance on our roads, and and uh, uh, the funds are there. I was told the funds are there to do this, and we are just asking to do the routine maintenance on the roads that is, and, and get back on track to where we should be. We gave up three weeks worth of it last year. Now, if we don't do it, we'll be giving up three weeks this year. And at some point in time, the longer you wait to do maintenance, the more costly the repair bill gets. That's just the way it is. Whether you're dealing with roads or a home or whatever, or your automobile, whatever. Do your routine. It's like the old, uh, what, the old uh, automobile, uh, the filter commercial. Pay me now or pay me later. Change your filter for three or four bucks back then or pay me a couple thousand for a new engine down the line. Well, it's cheaper to replace that filter, and that's what we are asking for, to get back and keep those roads up to snuff. Go ahead, David. I think something that should also be mentioned is if you look at the fiscal impact that's on this resolution in the lower left-hand corner, you find it's going to cost us $135,000 if we do the furloughs. So you're going to pay the $135,000 regardless. And if you're going to pay $135,000, you might as well get some work for it instead of not getting more. Yes. And just the funds, the just funds to clarify that, uh, a lot of people, and I have to mention this every so often, unemployment funds for the county come out of the tax levy dollar, not from the fund that is accumulated in Madison that normal businesses pay into. So when you do lay someone off, that comes out of your tax dollars, correct? Susan. I just want to make sure I understand this. If we don't pass this, some folks will be furloughed. And even though I think I heard that the money for their salaries is in the budget, they won't be being paid. Some of that money won't be spent. Okay? But some money will be spent for uh, unemployment. unemployment. Thank you for Correct. the word. It just was gone. Um, and the work obviously won't get done, so there will be money left in the left in the salary budget, plus the work won't get done. And if I'm not I'm correct, the uh, hundred thirty five thousand dollars comes from a fund called what's it called, Shirley? Um, I forget what it's called. Okay. There's a fund there to cover unemployment unemployment, unemployment compensation. compensation. That's where that money would come from to do the hundred thirty five thousand, right? Nope. Nope. Wrong again. <laughs> Because highway is operated oh, yeah, like okay, a business right, right. and an enterprise fund, okay. all charges go directly to the highway department. Okay, but they still would have to pay the 135, like David said. It's pay as you go for unemployment. Okay. Any other questions? If not, go to your voter board and vote it up or vote it down, and then we'll take a break. I thought I did. Oh, I messed up.
That is passed 17 yes and 4 no. We'll take a 10 minute break. Does that qualify over the two thirds? 14 is all yes. you need? 14. Yes. <laughs> you got it, <laughs> huh? Good thing I guess. <laughs>